I just had an idea, um, a way of solving gun crime. The clothes. Baggy clothes make it really easy to conceal weapons. Um, you could make the point that if you could change the style, if you could change people's style, if you could improve their style, if you could make them wear suits or something, if you could make them wear something more casual, um, if you could encourage the community to wear a certain kind of clothing that makes the concealing of weapons and the accessibility to weapons um, make it um, cumbersome and difficult to, to pull out weapons, um, then it would be very difficult for the crimes to occur. Um, of course, they could keep a bag, they could keep a duffel bag, but then you could s stipulate to the, to the community that it would be important if you were going home that you um, have your duffel bag in a place that makes it less, makes it more cumbersome to get a gun from. So maybe a backpack. Because getting if a gun was in the backpack, you have to take off the backpack to get the gun. That takes some time versus if you had a duffel bag um, or have a fanny pack, or maybe a fanny pack's worst case. Maybe if um, your bag was in your jeans. There's all sorts of things that could be done here. Maybe rather than having duffel bags, you encourage people to use wheeling accessories that have like boxes like you know you see old people use these things from time to time that you put your bags on a wheeling accessory you don't carry it in your hand and um but the idea is is to make it more cumbersome to to wield the weapon to to have to get the hand, weapon in hand and if you see anybody who is not abiding by those regulations of how your clothes are supposed to be, how your, um, you know, for the purposes of safety, um, then um, it's going to make the policing difficult, okay? Because the problem with policing is trying to determine if somebody has in possession a weapon. And if they have lots of baggy clothes and, um, you know, to some extent, you need that stuff. But I mean, in the winter time, it makes more sense. But at least you could cut it in half because in the summertime, there doesn't need to be baggy clothes. You're going to have, um, you're going to be wearing light amount of clothes. But um, what do you do? How would you? I would think by changing the clothing, probably it could be a a different way of dealing with the problem, um, like. Also, um, things like making the guns heavier could make it difficult to keep them in your shorts. They would they would hang around. So the if the uh, gun manufacturers were to make their guns quite a bit heavier whenever they release them, then it would force a lot of the guns that are used out on the street to come from other places than the gun companies see if your guns were heavier. So you add a lead weight to the gun about uh, um, five pounds. And that is being the entire body of the gun. And if you pick up a gun and it is not the proper weight, then you, uh, then you confiscate it, see. And, um, Of course, if you find a weapon on them, you would confiscate it anyhow. But I'm just saying that there's, there's some of the solutions to problems are not the are not the most straightforward. They're they're on the outside of the problem. They're it's making when I when I play 3D video games, um, 
one of the things I would do in order to change the strategy is I would actually eliminate the things that people count on. Um, like whenever you're taking your buddies and you're going to go and you're going to flank uh, in a map and you have a straight map and you have all these trees and stuff. Um, I was in Battlefield. This was um, Battlefield um, Bad Company 2. And you had the ability to use C4 to take down trees. And so I'd spend most of the game taking down the trees so that the enemy couldn't flank. You know, they'd come to this area and there would just be like no trees. And they were like, we didn't expect this. That's the thing. That's how you solve these problems is you, you change the environment. You change the, you change how things are arranged in the environment such that the predictability is not there. Um, you make things less predictable for the for the um, for the criminal. You you change the orientation. You might change the time that businesses run at. Um, you um, might ask. You know, it's creative thought. And the other thing is is not stressing because stressing um, is going to cause you to stop thinking. And so maybe. Rather than consulting people inside of your inside of your police department, you would consult with somebody who is less stressed in another part of the world that might be on the outside and might be able to see it from a different perspective. You might talk to several different people that are not really involved but but that would be encouraged and feel like they could probably help by giving some ideas and then you could take those ideas and then try to because if you're stressed you're you're not going to be thinking well uh, stress does not make people think well it's there is a documentary and i'll go to this documentary right now and it's called um stress portrait of a killer portrait of a killer full documentary and uh this is the guy Let's go about halfway. Let me see where it is that he starts talking about physiology. I think it's right in here. That night, this was like the greatest news. Never again were they going to have to sit down there, patients, and make eye contact and ask them how's it going. So anything stressful, it's got nothing to do with stress. It's bacterial disorder. So no longer would the solution be stress management. Now it could be something as simple as a pill. It was a major breakthrough. Stress didn't cause ulcers. Case closed. But a few years later, the research took a new twist. Scientists discovered that this ulcer-causing bacteria wasn't unique. In fact, as much as two-thirds of the world's population has it. So why do only a fraction of these people develop ulcers? Research revealed that when stressed, the body begins shutting down all non-essential systems, including the immune system. And it became clear that if you shut down the immune system, stomach bacteria can run amok. Because what the stress does is wipe out the ability of your body to begin to repair your stomach walls when they start rotting away from this bacteria. So stress can cause ulcers by disrupting our body's ability to heal itself. If stress can undermine the immune system, what other havoc can it wreak? One answer comes from a colony of captive macaque monkeys near Winston-Salem, North Carolina. People think of stress as something that keeps them up at night or something that makes them yell at their kids. But when you ask me, what is stress? I say, look at it. It's, it's this huge plaque in this artery. That's what stress is. For two decades, Dr. Carol Shively has been studying the arteries of macaques. Like baboons and British civil servants, 
These primates organize themselves into distinctly hierarchical groups and subject one another to social stress. Stress hormones can trigger an intense negative cardiovascular response, a pounding heart, and increased blood pressure. So if stress follows rank, would the cardiovascular system of a high-ranking macaque, call him a primate CEO, be different from his subordinate? When Shively looked at the arteries of a dominant monkey, one with little history of stress, its arteries were clean, but a subordinate monkey's arteries told a grim tale. A subordinate artery has lots more atherosclerosis built up inside it than a dominant artery is. Stress and the resulting flood of hormones had increased blood pressure, damaging artery walls, making them repositories for plaque. So now when you feel threatened, your arteries don't expand and your heart muscle doesn't get more blood and that can lead to a heart attack. This is not an abstract concept. It's not something that maybe someday you should do something about. You need to attend to it today because it's affecting the way your body functions. And if stress today will affect your health tomorrow and for years to come. Social and psychological stress, whether macaque, human, or baboon, can clog our arteries, restrict blood flow, jeopardize the health of our heart. And that's just the beginning of stress's deadly curse. Robert's early research demonstrated that stress can work on us in an even more frightening way. Well, back when I was starting in this business, what I wound up focusing on was what seemed an utterly implausible idea at the time, which was chronic stress and chronic exposure to glucocorticoids could do something as unsubtle and grotesque as kill some of your brain cells. As a PhD candidate at Rockefeller University in the early 80s, Sapolsky collaborated with his mentor, Dr. Bruce McEwen, to follow the path of stress into the brain. They subjected lab rats to chronic stress and then examined their brain cells. The team made an astonishing find. While the cells of normal rat brains have extensive branches, stressed rats' brain cells were dramatically smaller. And what was most interesting in many ways was the part of the brain where this was happening, hippocampus. You take intro neurobiology anytime for the last 5,000 years, and what you learn is hippocampus is learning and memory. Stress in these rats shrank the part of their brain responsible for memory. Stress affects memory in two ways. Chronic stress can actually change brain circuits so that we lose the capacity to remember things as we need to. Very severe acute stress can have another effect, which is often we refer to as stress makes you stupid, which is making it impossible for you in sh over short periods of time to remember things you know perfectly well. We all know that phenomenon. We all know that one from back when, when we stressed ourselves by not getting any sleep at all, and the next morning at 9 o'clock, we couldn't remember a single thing for that final exam. You take a human and stress them big time, long time, and you're going to have a hippocampus that pays the price as well. In addition to undermining our health, stress can make us feel plain miserable. Carol Shively set out to find out why. She began not with misery, but with pleasure. Shively suspected that there was a link between stress, pleasure, and where we stand on the social hierarchy. Just like stress, pleasure is linked to the chemistry of the brain. When a neurotransmitter called dopamine is released in the brain, it binds to receptors signaling pleasure. Shively used a PET scanner to examine the brain of a non-stressed primate, our primate CEO. 
what we see is that the brains of dominant monkeys light up bright with lots of dopamine binding in this area that's so important to reward and feeling pleasure about life. Shively then looked at the subordinate's brain. What we discovered is that the brains of the subordinate monkeys are very, very dull because there's much less receptor binding going on in this area. Why is that? What is it about this area of the brain? When you have less dopamine, everything around you that you would normally take pleasure in is less pleasurable. So the sun doesn't shine so bright, the grass is not so green, food doesn't taste as good. It's because of the way your brain is functioning that you're doing that, and your brain's functioning that way because you're low on the social status hierarchy. One feature of a low rank is being low ranking, the reality, an even stronger feature by the time you get to humans is not just being low ranking or poor, it's feeling low ranking or poor. And one of the best ways for society to make you feel like one of the have nots is to rub your nose over and over and over again with what you don't have. Richmond, California, a town where society's extremes can be spotted right from your car. This is cardiologist Jeffrey Ritterman's regular commute. You can learn a lot about the, the stress and health outcome just from the neighborhoods you visit. In, in this neighborhood, the, uh, the life expectancy is quite good and most of the people are pretty healthy. And uh, as we reach the top of the hill, it gets to be a little bit uh, less privileged. And as we make this transition, the uh, social status begins to drop, and correspondingly, in those areas, the, the health outcome is much worse. And these people are not going to have the same life expectancy as the people in the, the middle class area we started in. People are on guard. People are vigilant. They're living a more stressful life. This is a community that produces high stress hormones in people, and over time, it takes its toll. One of Dr. Ritterman's patients is 65-year-old Emmanuel Johnson. His career? Guidance counselor in one of America's most dangerous neighborhoods. Well, last year, I think we had 47 homicides. You know, in the last uh, four days, we had 11 shootings, three deaths. And I just know nine times out of ten, it's going to be a relative or someone that the kids know. For Emmanuel Johnson, there is a price for chronic exposure to this stress. Five years ago, I had a heart attack. I'm a diabetic, too. I had to work on it constantly because I've been in this business 20 years. So it's just it's stressful just working the job. So over the years, the, you know, the, the, the cholesterol, the blood pressure, the sugar came on later but the stress was always there long before they came on emmanuel johnson's body may be telling yet another story of stress the whitehall study in england found an incredible link between stress your position in the social hierarchy and how you put on weight so it may not be just putting on weight but also the distribution of that weight and the distribution of that weight Putting it on round the centre is related to position in the hierarchy, and that in turn may be related to chronic stress pathways. So we said, does that happen in monkeys? Because they organise themselves in a hierarchy too. And it turns out that it does. Uh, subordinate monkeys are more likely to have fat in their abdomen than are dominant monkeys. I think the most amazing observation that I've made in my lab is this idea that stress could actually change the way you deposit fat on your body. To me, that was a bizarre idea that you could actually alter the way fat is distributed. Sapolsky, Shively, and others think stress could be a critical factor in the global obesity epidemic. Even worse, Fat brought on by stress is dangerous fat. You know that fat carried on the trunk or actually inside the abdomen is much worse for you than fat carried elsewhere on the body. It behaves differently. It's, it, is, um, it produces different kinds of hormones and chemicals and has different effects on your health. 
whatever it is that works for an individual, they, they need to value stress reduction. I think the problem in our society is that we don't value stress reduction. We, in fact, value the opposite. We admire the person who not only multitasks and does two things at once, but does five things at once. We kind of admire that person. How do they manage that, you know? Well, that's, it's, that's incredibly stressful way to live. We have to change our values and value people who understand a, a balanced and serene life. Okay, so you you know to watch this documentary. And the other thing I need to talk about here is, is um, just what they were talking on there is, is that we need to um, be less accessible in our in our society. Um, you, having cell phones on us all the time means that um, means that our employers are going to be able to call on us wherever we are and bring us into work, and the employers are going to are going to take the fact that um, your job is your life and um, that you'll do anything to to keep your job. And that produces stress. And if the employer works this way, if they really abuse their employees, we need to be keeping databases of these kinds of um, treatment across the entire states. Every anonymous databases, we need to be collecting this information and letting people know where there are businesses, where um, people are, things are expected more of people in, in ways that they shouldn't be stressed. However, it is in the ways the case, sometimes people are running their own business. Um, if you're running your own business, you probably ought to be working for somebody else while you're doing it, if it's not profitable. Because um, because in this day and age, um, there are a lot of big boys and they can knock you over at any time. You can't rely on on um, on a business being a lifestyle business that is going to be um, trustworthy unless you're in a community where everybody supports you and the people in the community have enough money to keep you um, well supported. Um, the big problem in our world is, is there are a lot of greedy people and we got a lot of, and all these excessive problems, all these um, need for people to survive. A big part of it, I think that we could pretty much eliminate is watching television because television adds to it social stress, um, concern about how you look, concern about what you wear, concern about, um, how, uh, who's the most famous and things like that. If you pretty much eliminate that thing, then you're probably going to be watching documentaries on YouTube. And that's less stressful for me. It might be stressful for other people. But the thing is, is that, um, is that television brings stress into people's lives. And, um, Concern for survival, concern for your job. Um, people who don't have any form of religion in their life, don't have any faith, um, not being able to pray, not being able to meditate, um, are going to have more stress. And so that, I mean, if you try to see the whole world as being, as being a machine that, that people don't treat people well, um, that you can expect everybody to treat you the same way that uh, you would treat them rather than treating people well, expect that they're going to treat you bad, you, therefore you just don't treat other people well. That kind of, that kind of behavior produces this, this world where we're like a, a car that's, um, that's running on empty, and the and there's very little oil in the car. It's very it's got a lot of friction. It's about to to fall apart. And um, the things that permit the car to be well lubricated is love, good feelings, and and giving money back if you're an employer, rather than being so concerned about 
being able to um, get something and try to be more profitable and things like that, rather than being so focused on money, be more focused upon maintaining a consistency, something um, maintaining um, a feeling, um, trying to get, trying to make people feel better rather than trying to make a lot of money. Because sometimes people make money in order to, in it, they think that if they get a nice car, people will respect them, and then it'll, it's like they're going to get loved for that. And it's really stupid because people will love you uh, more if you if you treat everybody better, if you look out for their needs and and are less concerned about your own needs. Um, that's a way you get love. It's not buying a car. And um, in, in that kind of greediness, that buying to try to get love um, it's, isn't satisfying. Eventually, and it, and it happens with people that buy everything and think that money is going to solve their problems, eventually kill themselves because they find out that they, they're alone. Nobody cares. And it's because they didn't treat anybody else all that well. They didn't develop any friendships. They didn't look for out for other people. And that's how you reduce your stress is by looking out for others, um, by trying to treat people better, by trying to find ways of making people's lives easier, even on the smallest scale, you know. Um, picking up trash is something like never see anybody pick up trash. And, you know, you just, this is the reason why the hippies took drugs is um, the drugs permitted them to get outside of all the confines of all the stress, the structure, the social stress that was making people look a certain way, um, walk a certain way, talk a certain way. Um, think a certain way and, they, and people had all these psychological um, all these psychological fences in their mind about how things need to be working and in order to to maintain consistency and uh, when people took the drugs they lost all that and then they started to see the whole world with new eyes and that's the reason that's what these hippies did. It's not saying it was the best way to do things, but it was a different way of doing things. These were people that were tired of the the plasticness of society. That society had become um, it had become heavy on consumerism, and we're at that point now. We're heavy on consumerism, and we're using things to define ourselves rather than who we are to define ourselves. And um, and people expect, since it's a very materialistic, capitalistic society, that um, nobody's going to ever care about the homeless. Nobody's ever going to want to understand the homeless. Um, people prefer to be complacent in their shells. They prefer to be in their bubbles. They prefer their worldview, their perception of the world, um, that if they can stay in that, that they're satisfied. If the, anything goes outside the bounds of their understanding of what they believe is true, then they get up in arms and they feel need to protest, they get stressed. And the stress causes them to stop thinking. And then it causes them to create little clicks. And, you know, it's just like a riot. When you're in a riot, um, nobody thinks. Um, the riot thinks everybody thinks with the most aggressive person in the in the group and and they're afraid um they're excited but they're afraid and um they're empowered um but you know there's all sorts of things and it you a riot people in a riot can't think individually an individual's thought can't have much control there because the majority of how people feel there, which is stressed and upset, um, it, it can go in any direction. It's the reason why police come in and try to take it over is because they probably understand that when you're stressed, you're gonna make stupid decisions. You're gonna start um, breaking into, into buildings. You're gonna, the people who, who would have inhibitions 
are, are going to be uninhibited because they've got a militia there. And, um, and if anybody's in the way, they're going to be running for their life. So it's a good time to go and loot. You know, it's some... Um, But the, the people that are in the right are not going to be processing that. They're going to be thinking about something else. They're going to be stressed. So, anyhow, I think I'll just quit this guy.